This is a video on his, the history of Longbow Key here. And when we consider history, you usually consider human history, and we have a rich human history here. Uh, it goes back about um, 10 to 15,000 years ago. If you look at the map of Florida here, you see where the shoreline was um, 10 to 15,000 years ago. That's about a hundred miles out um, off the coast of Florida, the coast we have now. And the human history goes back 10 to 15,000 years, so they would have uh, looked at Flor uh, Florida that looked uh, much like this map. And uh, where Longboat Key is now would have been a, um, a plain like you would see in Africa or like you would see in Arcadia. This is one of the earliest maps uh, showing terra incognita. So there was a lot of terra incognita in those days. And this is from the map collection at um, the uh, museum, the Tampa Bay History Center. They have a great map collection there. And uh, you can see in the early maps in Florida, uh, covered a lot more area. But uh, the important thing is to understand that this was just something that they were groping with to understand this new world. And uh, another interesting thing is, is that some of these maps are made by the Dutch, some were made by uh, the French, some by the English, and some by the Spanish. So each of these countries had their eyes set on the new world, and Florida, as you can see, was a uh, a big part of the New World. Uh, Cuba in these maps you can see are well represented. Uh, Cuba was uh, better known than Florida and this map illustrates it right here. Um, so Cuba was the Pearl of the Antilles, the center of uh, trade in the, in the Caribbean in those days and Florida was uh, a little unknown. In this map it's interesting to see the shoreline, they have uh, used their, uh, you know, depth sounders, which was led on a string, to find the, uh, the shelf. So that shows the shoreline, even though the map is uh, distorted, it shows the shoreline. But it's interesting to see uh, how uh, they perceived this area and how they uh, understood it as time went on and this is a more modern map you can see uh, like I think it says 1845 but um, here's a uh, spirit to Santu Bay uh, that would be um, the uh, name of Tampa Bay in the early days on the uh, on the Spanish charts uh, here's a picture of uh, Fort Brook a drawing of what Fort Brook looked back like back in 1824. So it gives you an idea of the history of the area, how primitive Tampa was a small city. Uh, Fort Brook was an encampment where they were protected from uh, Indian raids, which they had in those days. Well, they had the uh, Seminole Indians. And, uh, there were some, several wars uh, that were uh, held back then. And uh, you see this... Uh, map it's getting more distinct the uh the coastline of florida but you you know think in the uh the ancient days the days before uh the europeans came that the uh paleo indians were hunting uh megafauna you know in the where we see the gulf today uh here's long key it was a description of uh, you wonder where the name Longboat Key came from. Well, at one time, um, Anna Maria Island was called Long Key, and uh, Longboat Key was called Palm Island. You can see here Anna Maria Island is Long Key, and Longboat Key is Palm Island. So uh, over the years, the name Long Island went down to Longboat Key, which is actually longer than Anna Maria Island. And Anne Maria was named uh, Anna Maria. So, how Longboat Key was named Longboat Key, I don't know exactly, but 
um, it could be that the name Long Island just shifted. And in the early days, this is about uh, 1913, uh, there was some uh, speculation and, you know, real estate uh, speculation that uh, there was going to be a boom here. And uh, so they really were greedy. They made small lots, and this is the north end of Longboat Key. Here's a map that's just interest, interesting because it's a captain's map. It's one that somebody actually drew themselves to uh, help find their way in. So in those days, there were a lot of secrets going on. Uh, these are cowboys. This is one of my ancestors in front of uh, Fort Brooks back around 1900. I think it was about the Spanish-American War. Uh, you wonder how people got here in the early days. Well, horse was not a great way to travel, and it took a long time, and it could be a rough trip. So these boats, uh, these steamers, uh, made it easy for passengers to go for a pleasant ride on a boat. And this is where my great uncle comes in. This is John Sabres, and uh, he was a famous character, and that was his boat, the Mistletoe. And those little sailboats would sail up, and either it was a race, which he was uh, big on sailboat racing, or they were just bringing fish or vegetables to the boat. And here's the mistletoe uh, of when it was stretched out and made longer. It was 54 feet, and they made it 75 feet. So, um, And here's the mistletoe again. So this is the boat that really opened up trade from Tampa to Sarasota and uh, came to Longboat Key and my great uncle bought a piece of property at the North End in uh, 1913. Here's a newspaper ad advertising the service. And so all of a sudden it was not an adventure to come down to Longbow Key. It was a pleasant uh, boat ride. And that's John Sabres. He founded the Italian American Club and had uh, the biggest fish house in the southeastern United States. And um, here are some early photos, aerial photos, of, uh, of the north end of Longboat Key and Longboat Key Pass. And uh, you can see that there were not very many people. And this, about uh, 1940, uh, you see very few uh, people on the island back in that time. Uh, in 1960, we had about a thousand people here on the whole island. So um, this is a map from about 1940, and you can see some uh, development, and this is a, lot, a map from 1951. So you can begin to see where they were dredging canals and they were uh, filling inside of seawalls and uh, making it more habitable for humans. And, and uh, this is uh, another map from about that time. Um, the pass has always been interesting just to see it. It's like a big lava lamp, the way it changes. And um, these pictures, these aerial photographs just show the change. And, you know, the more you look, the more you see. And the more you know, the more you see. So that's the way these maps are. And I put Photoshopped in 1883 because a lot of times they don't put the uh, date where you can uh, see it on the map. So. Uh, and here shows, you know, this was uh, as uh, early as, uh, I, I would say as late as 1970, uh, there was a big wilderness area on Longbow Key. So 1960, there were a thousand people, but until Arvida did their development in the 70s, there was that big wilderness area that you see. Those are the Cheerio cottages some of the early cottages, and they were small uh, <coughs> motel-type operations with cottages. That's the trailer park right there, and again, you see the big wilderness area there. Uh, you know, what was there before they developed? I think it sounds exciting to just think about it, all that area and uh, no people. Uh, so this is a view of Longbow Key from the north to the south and again there's that wilderness area that became the Arvida development, Cheerio Cottages and there was the Whitney Beach Cottages on the uh, north end and uh, you can kind of see them if you uh, 
you know, a look at the very north end of the island. Uh, on the Gulf, there were uh, cottages. I mean, I think you can see them in this picture right here. Uh, they would be the ones closest to the water on the uh, Gulf side. And this is the Colony Beach, and you can see that it was built uh, right among, uh, well, it was the only thing there, and then also there was uh, signs of a catastrophic event with uh, dunes resulting. And in the early days, the people, they uh, fished, they went out in the boat. These are my family pictures, but, uh, you know, I remember that's me in the bottom there. Uh, them singing a lot and drinking a lot and just fishing and swimming, and those were what we did in the old days. There's my father with a turtle. We had a marina, and anybody who caught anything big, they would bring it by, whether it was a shark or a turtle or a fish or a stingray or anything. That's the cottage that I grew up in uh, at the north end of Longboat Key, and it was called Land's End because it was isolated, and there were a lot of cottages in the middle of nowhere, and back then uh, in the early 50s and the 40s, you know, there were a lot of rattlesnakes on the island and uh, a lot of wilderness. Uh, I remember, this is just a cute uh, cartoon that someone had from back then, and I thought it was funny to just show you how simple life was and these are the bathing beauties and they're out on the beach and uh, soaking up the sun and having a good time so um, this again these are our family photos but they could be uh, replicated you know all the way down the island there were families enjoying uh, this paradise back when there weren't many people I tell people in 1960 when I was growing up there were less than 10% people and or habitated areas and 90% wilderness areas. Uh, this was a real easy lifestyle. Everybody enjoyed it. But the point was, is we had no idea that, you know, it would uh, become 95% uh, human habitation with less than 5% wilderness areas left. But these scenes, just if you wonder what people did in the early days, they sailed, they fished, they swam, and no TV, no telephones. And uh, when that bridge was put in, we started a business, and this was our marina. My dad has the beard on the left, and he was a ray contour, told stories, and enjoyed it here. And he and mother came here as a young married couple and had some kids, and uh, that's them right there enjoying the sun and here's daddy looking for uh, Land's End. He was on a trip with some uh, titles to properties that my great uncle gave mother and daddy and uh, they were looking for property and there's mother with Michael, my sister and a Doberman and uh, my uncle Jack. And that's Joni, my sister. She was a, a beauty queen and everybody wanted her to you know, get in the picture, so there she is fishing. This is the way they used to cook fish. Uh, an old fisherman right there, Horace Roberts, is showing us how the Indians cooked fish. And those are palmetto fronds. It was really pretty. And that's a storm. <clears throat> and storms have been very much a part of Longboat Key history. Uh, hurricanes, and uh, fortunately we haven't had a bad one in a while. And everything was resolved around, revolved around boats. That was my family going out boating and fish, lots of fish. That was the Mercury Hurricane 10. And, and our place was precariously perched. Every storm, everybody worried about it. And there's a hurricane right there. And you can see how uh, with a little bit higher tide, it would have been a quite different story. And the house could have floated off. And, uh, there's my sister skiing, one of them, I can't tell which one, but uh, I, I don't know if it's Joni or Michael, but uh, here's Michael playing in the water when she was a kid. And again, it was just, I think, the charm of Longboat Key was the nature and the simplicity of people just going about their business, recreating and having fun. And, you know, the biggest uh, problem was what we were going to have for dinner and who was going to catch what. 
There were lots of blue crabs. You see the guy with the blue crab net. There were, uh, you know, all kinds of fish and clams and oysters. And there's Michael in the house. Most of the houses were built out of native woods. They were very pretty with pine and cypress. And this is my mom with one of the babies. We were all raised like that just as soon as we were able, we were taken out in the water and kind of introduced to it. I like this picture. It's not so good, but it's my mom and dad having a nice time. And that's always nice to see people enjoying life. And This is at Land's End where I lived. There was a shark fishery here where a uh, man, Sharky Holbrook, who's in this picture, uh, used to bring in sharks as a business. Now that's a great white shark and they say it was 24 feet long, but uh, there's nothing to document that. These are more bathing beauties. One is my aunt, one's my mother's friend. And, uh, here's a picture of some girls uh, with a tarpon. So tarpon fishing was always part of the excitement. And here's your classic beach scene. You see the sailboat off on the horizon and the lawn chairs out on the beach and birds and uh, people who are interested in, in bird watching, whether you're a member of the Audubon Society or just an amateur, it's always pleasing here. And this is a beautiful uh, white heron. And back in the early 1900s, they had the plume trade. So birds were afraid of people in the early days because people shot them and uh, killed them and took their, uh, their plumes. They stopped that around 1920. There's a barracuda. And there were lots of snakes on the island. The, the habitat on Longboat Key as a barrier island was uh, very rich uh, for reptiles. And here is something that looks prehistoric, but it's a baby pelican. So they're kind of, you know, skinheads when they're small. And this is another snake. This is a corn snake, and they're real friendly. They're one of the, you buy them in pet stores, and they're one of the snakes you can pick up off the ground and they won't bite. Now these black snakes, they do bite. You pick them up off the ground, but they're real fast, they're hard to catch, and that's why they're still around. Uh, we have box turtles, which are kind of neat, and uh, here's these girls with a fish again, and again, you know, tarpon fishing was one of the things that drew people here. It was just recreation. They didn't eat them. Uh, here's another corn snake. They're very beautiful snakes and native to the island. And uh, there are still corn snakes here, but I think we need to protect them. When we were kids, we were raised with uh, the native animals. There's a raccoon we had for a pet. And we'd raise them until they'd take off and then we'd kind of see them, and all the coons we'd see would be cooney. That would be our pet. This is a mangrove snake. It's a rare snake, but it's uh, endangered. It's on Longboat Key. Uh, this is a, a box turtle. You can see how pretty they are, the pattern on their shell, and that's, again, a native box turtle. Lots of shells. Uh, you know, I just put this shell in just so you would see. This one's... I saw it in a shell store for sale for about $75, one just like it. Hawks, we have all kinds of hawks, and some of them are uh, displaced from the uh, land out east because they're developing it so much, and they come back here to Longboat Key to sort of... And this is another beautiful scene, just a bayou, and uh, it was pretty. And you heard me mention rattlesnakes in the earlier... Uh, as being an issue on Mongo Key, and there were a lot of them, but look at, there's one hiding. Now you can't see it, but there it is. And with all the talk of rattlesnakes, I don't ever remember anybody being bitten or dying from a rattlesnake bite, so they're really not that dangerous. Here's a coon, a baby coon, and there's nothing much cuter than a baby coon. They're like puppies or kittens. They're just as cute as they can get, and lots of fish. So the area is rich in, in all kinds of fishing. Offshore fishing is great. Um, the inshore fishing here. Uh, these are white pelicans feeding out in front of some mangroves, some trim mangroves. And um, here is a baby eagle in an eagle's nest on Longboat Key. So there were some eagles that were uh, had a nest and raised babies here. Uh, this is a railroad vine flower. It's a beautiful flower. It's a beach 
uh, grows on the beach and uh, the beaches are real resilient plants are fast growing here's another sunset scene I thought you probably would want at least one sunset scene but uh, you know Longboat Key is just one sunset scene after another this is Big Bird and you actually get friendly with the birds they are around they stay so close and uh, it's important that we try to protect these so that we uh, have something for people to come look at in the future. These birds, they always look like they're dressed in tuxedos, but they're skimmers. They're real neat birds. It's a pileated woodpecker in an Australian pine tree. and uh, You know, it's a, a beautiful endangered species that uh, uses these trees. And in the water, uh, this is a... Uh, seahorse and uh, you can pull the seine and, and get these uh, little creatures and there's just the closer you look the more you see so it's a beautiful area and uh, that's why we want to preserve it and, and keep it the way it is. Uh, these are manatees kissing and uh, it's kind of cute they actually you know whether it's anthropomorphic to say they're kissing but they certainly seem affectionate. And there's an osprey in a tree, in an Australian pine tree. And um, there are large fish hawks. And this is a uh, possum and they're uh, marsupial. And the kids are just climbing out on the possum's back and they're native to Lombokie. And again, here's a beach scene. This is, uh, you know, your dream come true. You just walk 